We are in the middle of a series on relationships. Um, and so if you got a Bible, go ahead and turn to Genesis 2. That's where we're going to start this morning. We're going to be bouncing around quite a bit. And so I'll try to give you a heads up as we get to those places. Uh, we'll also be in Proverbs a good bit. Today we're going to talk about one of the most significant relationships that you will ever have. Okay. And, and, and before I get into it, let me say this. Regardless of your relationship status right now, uh, whether you are married or single and want to be married or whatever it is, okay? You don't need a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You don't need a fiance. You don't need a spouse. There are really only two relationships that every single person on this earth needs. One is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And two, friends. We need friends, we're made for friends. We need friendships. And so if you got that weekly, that little bulletin there, um, I want you to do this exercise really quickly. And that is to write down real quick your, your two to five closest friends that you have, right? So just do that for me if you can. Take your weekly uh, or the connect card you got there. Just write down your two to five closest friends. I know some of you don't have five, so that's why I said two to five, because it's going to uh, help everybody here. Write down the two to, cl to five closest friends that you have. And while you do that, I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, I think that we take the word friend too lightly. And so to illustrate that, I want to tell you about my friend Daryl. Uh, Daryl is from the country of Wales. He... Uh, he went to veterinary school originally, but he became really interested in neuroscience during that mad cow disease thing that was uh, way back. And so he actually got into neuroscience and he got his PhD in neuroscience and actually ended up doing a stint at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, studying human neuroscience. And uh, <clears throat> so he resides in Jacksonville now. But now he's, he started his own company, uh, Jones Scientific, and he's working on um, supplements to help with memory loss and recovery and that kind of thing, um, <clears throat> and to prevent you, like, uh, Alzheimer's treatments and that kind of thing. Um, he loves Jesus ferociously, and, uh, and he just adopted this, this dog, like, I think it's like an Australian hound or something, beautiful dog, and uh, he named it Loki, which I think is pretty funny. That's his dog's name. But here's the most important thing I want you to know about my friend Daryl. I have never met him. I don't, I've never met him. He friended me on Facebook, and I spent about five minutes and just told you all this stuff I learned about him. And you're like, that's creepy. Well, that's a pastor's life, okay? So, <laughs> see, we take the word friend too lightly. We, we have a ton of friends, but hardly any of us are actually really known. In fact, there was a study by Cigna Healthcare just recently, and uh, one of the things that they discovered in surveying over 20,000 people is that over half of them, I think it was 54%, said that there isn't a single person who actually knows them well. Think about that. Over half of all of the people that they surveyed said there's not a single person who knows them well. So, so here's the questions I want to try to get our arms around this morning. What makes friendship so important? And what do healthy friendships actually look like? Right? What, what makes friendships so important and what do healthy friendships look like? So uh, I'm going to start in Genesis 2. Let me pray for us and then uh, we'll get going here. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your kindness to us. I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to gather this morning under the authority of your word. And I pray that you would be honored and glorified as we study this morning. I pray for each of us in the room that we would be challenged, encouraged, and changed by your word and your spirit. That you'd help us to understand rightly what it means to have friends, to be friends, and that you would empower us by the gospel to be the friends that the world needs. And so help us this morning, we pray in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. By the way, I wanna give just a quick thanks to all those who helped put on our Enneagram conference over the weekend. Did you guys enjoy the Enneagram conference? Three of you did? Awesome, okay. We had over 100 people, and uh, for the weekend, I thought it was fantastic. And so particularly, uh, Sarah Gaffney and Dawn Steed um, did an amazing job, Jenny Landrum as well, with helping get our kids thing organized. Uh, we had a great time. I think a lot of people learned a lot, and we're hoping to do more of that kind of thing in the future. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, let's do it again sometime. What do you say? All right? All right, Genesis 2. 
So you know, God is in this rhythm. We've been back to Genesis in every sermon in this series so far because everything starts in Genesis. And uh, God's in this rhythm of creating. And as he creates, he calls his creation good. And then, uh, as we've said several times before, we get to this little weirdness in Genesis 2, 18, when God says, it says, the, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and all the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. And so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were naked and were not ashamed. Now, this is primarily about a man and a woman, okay? Uh, and, and God blesses their covenant relationship of marriage. But I want you to see something here. I, I mentioned this before, but theologians have called this passage one of the great theological weirdnesses in the Bible because this takes place before sin enters the world. And it's the first time that God says of anything in his creation, this is not good that he creates everything and he calls it good, but when he sees that man is alone, he says that is not good. What does that mean? It means that mankind's desire for companionship, for friendship, is not a result of the fall. God created us with a desire, a need for friendship and companionship because we are image bearers of God. We are reflecting a God who is eternally friendly, right? Father, Son, and Spirit are in eternal, uh, glorious friendship with one another. And out of the overflow of the joy experienced among the Trinity, creation happened. And we bear the image and the likeness of God, which means we are by nature relational beings. We need relationship. One theologian said, every other ache in the human heart is a result of sin. Every other longing of the human heart is a result of sin. But this ache, this desire is not part of Adam's imperfection, but rather his perfection. So God, in his kindness and goodness, creates another human being as a companion and a friend because he needs one. Now, I want you to see something really, that, that's really important. Um, when he creates the woman, the scripture says that he takes a rib from Adam out of his side and he creates her as a companion out of his side. Now, there's a, a few reasons why that's really important, but I want to draw you to one. Uh, C.S. Lewis, the, the great uh, author and theologian, uh, he, he wrote a book called The Four Loves. And he talks about the, the Greek words for love. There's four different ones. There's a familial love. There's an erotic or a, you know, relational love. There is a, a, a friendship kind of love. And then there's a, a, he calls it a Christian love, right? A, a, a Christian love. And so in speaking primarily about uh, eros, the erotic love, and, and philia, which is a friendship love, he says this. He says, if you were to draw a picture of eros, what it would be is uh, uh, two people facing one another right? I mean, you know where it goes from there. So you've got naked and unashamed, right? So you got a, a, a man and a woman facing each other, and that's a picture of this sort of uh, eros kind of love. But he says, if you're going to draw a picture of friendship love, it's going to be two people side by side. So I need you to see this. What God creates for the man first is a friend, and then she becomes his lover, but God knew there was an ache inside of Adam. There was a need that he had for a friend, for a companion. And so he gives the woman to the man and they are friends first and then become lovers. They are naked and unashamed, which means, yes, they were physically, and you probably don't want to do that with all your friends. But secondly, <laughs> they were emotionally and spiritually vulnerable. They were emotionally and spiritually vulnerable before God and before one another. And God said, that's very good. That's very good. Now, let's be honest. I know we're in church, but can we be honest for a minute? It's hard to make good friends, isn't it? 
it's hard to make good friends. But as we're going to see in the book of Proverbs in just a minute, without good friends, Proverbs says you're not going to make it. And you might think, ah, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of an individualist. I don't really need a lot of people in my life. But I'll tell you something. You step outside of the Bible and, and science will even tell you you need friends. That same study from Cigna Health that I was talking about earlier, in that study, they, they, they had a correlation between not how many friends you have, but whether or not you have friends. And there is a significant, a statistically significant correlation between whether or not you are in regular interaction with human friends and your physical and emotional health. So if you are a person who does not have any friends or who does not regularly engage with other people on a friendship level, you are statistically more likely to be unhealthy physically and unhealthy emotionally. But to the degree that you do have friends and are in regular interaction with friends, you are physically and emotionally more healthy. Bottom line is science confirms what the Bible tells us, which is you need friends. We all need friends. So the question becomes, what kind of friends do we need? What kind of friends do we need? So to do that, we're going to go to the book of Proverbs. If you've got your Bible, go to Proverbs. I failed to mention this earlier, but if you don't have a Bible in front of you, you can also on that same app, info.mdcashville.org, you can click on a tab that says today, and it'll bring up all the passages that we're going to be in. So you don't have to flip back and forth, particularly if you're kind of unfamiliar with the Bible. Um, you don't have to be embarrassed by that, but all the scriptures will be up there for you. So you can go to info.mdcashville.org and click on today, and you will get there. Proverbs chapter 17. Let's start there and then we'll skip over to chapter 18. I want to show you four things that God says a friend uh, gives to us. Maybe I'll put it that way, okay? A friend does for us. Proverbs 17 uh, verse 17 says this, a friend loves at all times and a brother or but a brother is born for adversity. Don't, don't amen that just yet, okay? Uh, now skip over to chapter 18 and look at verse 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So, so a friend loves at all times, but a brother is born for adversity. And then uh, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but a f- there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. A friend, you may know this, a friend is better in some ways than a family member, than a sibling. That's really what he's getting at here in in Proverbs 17, that a friend is better than a sibling in some ways. And and this is written in a culture and a time that is family-oriented, family-centric. And so to say that that a friend is better than a brother or a sister was, was like, whoa, you don't say that. But here's the reason. Family love you like your brothers and your sisters, they'll love you. Your mother, your father will love you. You will, you will love your children. You will be there for them. You will support them, but you might not like them very much. <laughs> right? You're there. You, there's an obligation factor because we are blood. And so I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to help you. I've talked to many of you who have siblings or even parents or even children who just constantly get themselves into trouble whether it's because of addiction or whether it's just they're foolish and making bad choices and you're there for them and you're trying your best to support them and love them, but they just get on your nerves sometimes because they just keep making mistakes. But here's the thing, friends choose you. Friends choose you. A friend says, I want to be there for you. A friend prioritizes their relationship with you. See, if you think about it, nearly every other kind of relationship that we have just sort of gets forced on us, doesn't it? Like you can choose where you live, but you can't always choose your neighbors. Amen? (laughs) Okay? You can choose uh, the kind of job that you take, but you can't choose who's in the cubicle next to you. So you think family, you're born into a family or you marry into a family. Now that's your choice to a degree, but, but you know, your, your blood siblings or, or family members, you're just born into it. You don't get a choice in that. Or you're adopted into it. You don't get a choice in that. Okay, so all these other relationships that we have, whether it's family or neighbors or coworkers or the like, they, they just get sort of pressed on us and we don't have a choice in it. 
But friendship, you cannot force somebody into friendship. You can't just thrust friendship upon somebody. There has to be a commonality that gets discovered, doesn't it? Like, think about the good friends that you have. Think about uh, maybe your best friend or, or, your, or your closest couple of friends, and think about how you became friends with them. More than likely, there was some sort of time in your, in your relationship with them where you went, you too? You like that also? Or you love those books too? You watch that also? And there's a common bond that gets discovered that, that grows you deeper. Now, it may start as a surface level kind of thing, but you find common bonds, you find commonality, and you go, oh man, I didn't know anybody who liked that, but I like that and you like that, so now I'm attracted to you, not in a sexual way, I'm just attracted to you as a friend because I want to get to know you better. So, so I've got a, a handful of really tight friends, they, they all happen to be pastors, and we did a, a leader's um, training a few years ago called Leaders Collective. It was a thing where we got together once a quarter for about three or four days at a time. And I, I knew one or two of those guys before we started, but I didn't really know him well. And uh, so we get kind of lumped together and that is a forced thing, right? And if you join a community group, it's a forced thing for a little while. But our hope in that is that you find some chemistry, some commonality. Well, the nice thing about this was, um, and it's hard, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sound like a little whiny baby here for a minute, but it's, people don't really understand the burden and the weight that pastors carry. And I'm not complaining about that. It's just a reality, okay? But to, to go into a room with five other guys who are also pastors, and, and four of them are lead pastors, there was no explanation necessary. Like, I felt like they got me from the moment that we walked into the room because we share that common bond of ministry and understand what it's like with each other. And so it, that allowed us to just grow super deep all the time. I got a text from one of them this morning going, hey, I, heard, I, I think I remember you're preaching on friendship. Just want you to know I'm praying for you and I value you as a friend. And we talk almost every day, those six guys. It's amazing. But that was through a common bond that we discovered. Uh, if you flip over real quick, if you got your Bible open to Proverbs chapter 27, I'm gonna show you something here. In Proverbs chapter 27, and by the way, the reason why I'm skipping back and forth like this is Proverbs, you can't really preach expositionally. You can't, I mean, it's, it's a bunch of little one-liners, you know? It's like a bunch of tweets from the Lord. And so it's hard <laughs> to preach as a passage. And so I'm, I'm pulling out some verses that are all have a common theme here. Um, so Proverbs 27 verse nine says this, oil and perfume make the heart glad and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. The idea of sweetness in a friendship. Now, this is a time in a day when sugar was not readily available. So you couldn't just load things up with sugar to make them sweet. I mean, today, everything has sugar in it, right? We oversweeten everything. But back then, um, you couldn't make food sweet. You had to discover sweet foods. So that's why in, um, in Psalms, you'll see uh, David talking about the Bible and its sweetness is like honey to him because honey was one of the only natural sweet things that, that was around at that time, okay? Once you discovered something that was sweet, a food that was sweet, you loved it, you clung to it, right? You valued it highly because that, that taste of sweetness was rare. Well, good friends are like that. That, that there requires an affinity, there requires a common interest, but once it's discovered, it becomes really sweet and you cherish it and you hold on to it. It's one of the reasons I think in, in Proverbs 18, 24, he says, a friend sticks closer than a brother. That sweetness, that stickiness of a close friend. And this applies to marriage as well, Okay. In the Song of Songs, we're not gonna turn there, but you can just write down uh, Song of Songs 5.16. Th this is the line. This is my beloved and this is my friend. I believe it's the woman speaking at, time, at that time about her husband. This is my beloved, this is my friend. That good marriages are built on the foundation of good friendship. So one of the common questions I ask when I do engagement counseling, pre premarriage counseling is, um, tell me about your friendship, right? Because the problem with, with dating, the world of dating that we find ourselves in now is we usually start with physical attraction instead of friendship. 
We start with eros. So single people, you might be in a room with 10 other folks and automatically you eliminate three of them because they don't fit your physical attraction model. So you've just eliminated seven potentially really good people and you don't even know a thing about them other than they don't check my boxes in physical attraction. Or, you know, you get those dumb apps, you know, I forget, Tinder and all that stuff, and you're swiping, swipe, swipe left, swipe left, swipe, and you find one person that's kind of attractive, swipe right. They could be a complete idiot. And, and you don't know it until you get into a date with them, and then you're going, is this person I'm attracted to now someone I can be a friends with? We get it all backwards. So one of the advantages, I think, to, to some online dating, hear me, okay, and by the way, if you're ever going to do online dating, do not do anything with Christian in the name of it, okay? My mo- Listen, this is a true story. My mother-in-law, my father-in-law uh, passed away of cancer in 2006. A couple years later, my mother-in-law decided she wants to get back out there, okay? And so she tried Christian Mingle first, and it was a nightmare. She went on about six or seven dates, and all those guys were complete idiots. And they were just like bad men, like not good. And they were preying on women who wanted a Christian person, so, so just get rid of that subscription, get you an eHarmony or something like that. Um, I promise you, she went to eHarmony, she met one dude, married him six months later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some of you are like, okay, eHarmony, give me, signing up for that mug right now. But one of the values of that kind of online dating, as far as I'm aware of it, I've never, never participated in it myself, is that bec- the way that those profiles are written, you actually, it, it's, it bases the compatibility a lot on can you be friends? And a lot of the people in this church that I've done weddings for who met online built a friendship via email and phone calls and all that stuff before they ever met each other in person. And so they had a foundation of friendship established which made the attractional piece easy because they already knew the heart of that person. You see what I'm saying? So friends bring things into our lives that coworkers or family just can't bring. There's a value to it. Friends choose you and you have to choose friends. And sometimes it is far too easy to let the other things in life squeeze out our margin for friendship. But if you don't have it, you, you're gonna die, <laughs> okay? So friends choose you. Secondly, we're gonna stay in Proverbs 18 and in 27, so you can stay right where you are. Um, and again, I don't know why all these start with C. The Baptist in me just can't stay suppressed. So not only do friends choose you, friends commit to you. Friends commit to you. Okay, look at Proverbs 18, 24 again. Uh, Proverbs 18.24 says this, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. This is not a comparison or a contrast between two equal groups of people, right? He says, you may have many companions, but you will only have a friend or a few true friends. It's interesting that the the Hebrew word, uh, this Hebrew word for friendship um, can also be used as the the word for secret, meaning that a friend is someone who you let into the secret places of your heart. And that's why you can't have that many friends. So you don't have the capacity to be known on that level by everyone. It takes an incredible amount of time, takes an incredible amount of trust, and you just don't have the capacity to let everybody into all those deep places of your soul. That's a problem for people like me because I wanna know everybody, right? Even right now, I can look out and I see faces and I'm like, man, I don't know your name, I wish I did. I know your name, but I don't really know anything about you and I wanna know you really well because I'm an extrovert and I wanna know everybody and I wanna know you really well. But I can't. And so the tendency for me is that I, and, and the staff will sometimes say, how do you remember all these names? I don't know, I just do. And when I meet you, generally it's kind of locked in there. But I tend to be a mile wide and an inch deep with people because I just don't have the capacity to be known by everybody and, and to know everybody that deeply, right? So I got to work at making sure that I do go deep with a few 
and, and maybe still maintain knowing a lot of people. Jesus did the same thing, didn't he? Like there were 72, and then there were the 12, but then he had the three, right? Peter, James, and John were the three, and they were his close friends. They were the ones whom he asked to come with him and pray with him. They're the ones who went up on the Mount of Transfiguration with him. They're the ones in the Garden of Gethsemane that he said, brothers, will you please pray for me? My soul is, is, is burdened and disrupted. So you need close friends that will commit to you. See, we all have our guard up to some degree. Some of you have been vulnerable to other people and you've been burned. You've been betrayed. Some of you are just afraid of being known that deeply. Like if anyone really knew this part of me, I don't think they would want to be with me. I don't think they would want to be a friend to me. And so we keep our guard up because here's the reality. And listen, this is true of all. We all have quirks. We all have weird habits. <laughs> we all have hangups, don't we? We're, we're all strange in our own ways. Some of you more than others, okay? <laughs> That's right. Uh, But over time, when you're in relationship with people, you just can't help but be known. You can't keep those parts guarded forever. So over time, the walls start to come down a little bit, a little bit more trust starts to get out there, and you start to be a little bit more vulnerable, and you have the opportunity to be committed to. A friend commits to you. That's why, again, in, in Proverbs 18, 24, it says, there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Did you know that this word for sticks in Proverbs 18, 24, it's the same word that we find back in Genesis 2, 24, when it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Some of your translations will say cleave, leave and cleave. It's the same word that's used for cleave. A friend sticks, cleaves, holds fast to you. A friend will never let go of you. There's this beautiful story of friendship in the Old Testament. It's between jo uh, Jonathan and David. David became king of Israel. Jonathan was actually the son of Saul, who was the prior king. And they're unlikely friends because Jonathan would have been next in line for kingship um, and, and was Saul's chosen one. And yet God had chosen David to be king. So really they should have been enemies because they're both going for the throne, right? But the Bible tells us that for some reason, Jonathan and David had this friendship unlike any other. And in 1 Samuel chapter 18, it says that David and Jonathan's souls were knit together. It's a deep, loyal, committed love for one another. The deepest of friendships. But most friendships, most relationships that we have are actually companions. They're acquaintances more than they are actual friends. And honestly, a lot of people that you know, know you because you provide some benefit to them, some use for them. I hate to be so, you know, sort of cynical about it, but it's, it's reality, right? A lot of the people that know you, know you because you can do something for them. And, and if you think about it, a lot of the people that you know you know them because they can do something for you. So it's not, it's not that I love them just for them, it's I love them because of what they can bring to me, what they can do for me, how they can help me, what, how they can benefit me in my life. But a true friend sees you as an end, not as a means to some other end. And here's how you know. When you get in trouble, when you go through hardship, when you're suffering, when you're hurting, Everyone says, call me if you need anything. But a true friend says, I'm here. Isn't that true? And I'm not, it's not against the people that say, call me if you need anything. It's a, it's a very honorable thing to do. Hey, I'm, I'm, I will be happy to help you. Tell me what you need. But a true friend says, I'm here. I'm here right with you. Turn with me real quick. Just hold your finger in Proverbs. Turn with me over to Galatians, all the way to the New Testament. Galatians chapter 6. You guys hanging? All right, Galatians chapter six. You know you've got a real friend when you undergo a burden. Galatians chapter six, starting at the beginning, says this. Brothers and sisters, it's implied there. If anyone is caught in any transgression, 
You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Then in verse two, it shifts a little bit. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. How do you help someone bear a burden? What does that look like to help bear a burden? You gotta get close to them, don't you? You gotta get right with them. You gotta get up under it with them. Like the example I like to use is moving a couch up a staircase. How do you help somebody move a couch up a staircase? You get there late, that's right. Um, <laughs> ah, really, I'm sorry. I knew you were moving that couch and I tried traffic. Was, you live next door, it's one of those, okay? Um, no, you get up under that couch with them, right? You're gonna help them, you, and the moment you start to feel the weight of that thing on you, their weight lessens. You bear their burden by you take, you shoulder some of it with them and their burden lightens. That's how you bear a burden. So yeah, it's a burden. It's a burden to them and it becomes a burden to you, but it lightens their burden. And that's how you be a good friend to someone. When you're committed to your friends, you bear their burdens. You take on some of it. You shoulder some of it with them. And listen, the only way to bear someone's burden is to get up under it. And the only way you'll get up under it is if you're committed to them. A true friend is committed to you no matter what, thick and thin, right? They are there for you. They're committed to you. I really appreciated my friends this week when uh, we, we share often. We got this Marco Polo app, little video app and all the time. And mostly it's silly, like middle school humor type stuff. But occasionally the guys will get on and say, hey, I have this thing coming up. I'm dealing with this. My wife and I are having a conflict here, or I got, you know, and some of us are going through some pretty major stuff. Um, and so I, I was behind on some of them and I checked all the videos and then, you know, people, hey, Brian, how you doing? I said, hey, I'm doing okay, blah, 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 and kept going. Well, one of my friends comes back and he goes, hey, you never really answered the question. How are you doing? How, like, how are you doing? How are you really doing? And I was like, ah, busted, you know? Like, I, I need to share. And so I just spent about three, four minutes on that video and I said, all right, here, here's where I'm at, you know? And it was freeing for me, right? Because these burdens that I'm carrying, I now gave them some of and they're shouldering part of that with me. But you know what? Divided by five, six, it's not that bad, right? And so, and so someone, hey, thanks for letting us know. Thanks for sharing your heart with us so we know how to pray for you and encourage you. And it means the world to me. Right? Real friends are committed to you. Thirdly, this is where we're going to look at Proverbs 27. Uh, friends challenge you. Friends challenge you. Proverbs 27. Let's look at verses five and six. Better is an open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Now, this is probably the hardest part of friendship for all of us. There's a parallelism going on here in the text, right? There's wounds and there's kisses. There's friends and there's enemies. Here's what he's saying. To be a friend means you, are, you love someone enough that you're willing to tell them the truth. You're willing to challenge them. See, when he talks about hidden love here, okay, uh, verse five, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Sometimes we get into situations where we think the best thing to do is to not tell someone the truth. But most of the time, the reason for that is because it makes us uncomfortable. It's hidden love. We think we're being loving to them by not sharing everything or by hiding the truth from them. But if you've ever seen the first couple, season, uh, first couple episodes of any season of like American Idol or any of those kind of shows, you know that those people's friends are not really good friends for them, right? Those people that are horrible singers and get up there before the judges and just belt. And then the judges say, we've never had anyone worse than you. I don't know why you haven't got a number. Why are you here? And they go, my friend said I was good. 
Well, either your friends are tone deaf or they're not good friends. They told you what you wanted to hear, not what you needed to hear. Some of us are not good friends because we tell people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And the reason we do it is because we love ourselves too much. We love ourselves too much to let ourselves be uncomfortable by saying something that's going to be hard for someone else to hear. And the scripture says, that's as bad as Judas. You know, Judas betrayed Jesus, but he was at the dinner with him. Like up until the moment he left to go betray his friend, he's just there. Do you want to be a Judas or a Barnabas? Barnabas is an encourager. Judas is a betrayer. Which one are you to your friends? Okay. Real friends are willing to speak the truth even when it hurts. Hurts them and hurts you. Okay. Back in Galatians, we're not going to turn there again, but when he talks in verse one about restoring a friend who's in sin or is caught in a transgression, the word for restore has this concept, this idea of it, of resetting a broken bone or putting back in joint a dislocated joint. Okay. And some of you have experienced the pain of that, either a broken bone or a dislocated uh, bone or joint. And you know the pain of that, right? To reset it, they have to inflict more pain than you're actually in at the moment so that you can be healed, right? So that's what he's talking about, that a true friend challenges you, is willing to inflict healing pain to you. Because sin dislocates our souls and often we don't even notice it. So we need the wounds of a friend, not the kisses of an enemy. But listen, we all know people who are a little more truth than grace, right? Some of you are like, I don't know those people. That's because you are that one. Like, you're more truth than grace. And if you don't keep it in check, you become a bully. I'm just being real, man. I'm telling you, I'm calling it like I see it. Okay, you're being a jerk is what you're doing, right? There, there's a way to tell truth with love and grace and understanding that isn't bullying and isn't being a jerk. Some of you need to learn that. But then there's a whole bunch of others of us who are a little more grace than we are truth. And we're not bullies, we're wimps. We're unwilling to say the hard things. We're unwilling to say the challenging things. And unless you are walking in step with God's spirit, you will either be a bully or a wimp. We need, I mean, if you, you look at Jesus and you look at the way that he told truth, but told it with such tenderness and care, and sometimes, you know, stern rebuke to the religious people who needed it. But he was never a bully, he was never a wimp because Luke tells us that Jesus walked by the spirit. And you and I must walk by the spirit if we're gonna be anything other than a wimp or a bully. We'll get to this in a couple weeks. But when there's trust and when there's commitment that allows you to actually have real conflict because you can finally say what's true, you can finally be honest. And conflict in and of itself is not bad, it's actually good, depends on how you handle it, right? But conflict chat leads to challenge and challenge actually is what leads us to change. And that's the final thing that I wanna show you here, that friends change you, friends change you. Flip back with me to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13. Look at verse 20 of Proverbs 13. This is one of my favorite Past verses. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. All right, so this is where you get back out your list of your five, two to five closest friends. And you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Whoever walks with the wise, the, the idea of walks with is a, is a biblical term for friendship. Enoch walked with God and then he was no more. He, he had friendship with God. He was in relationship with him. Whoever walks with those who are wise becomes wise. But the companion, the friend of fools will suffer harm. Your friends determine your future, okay? They change you. You say, nah, I don't think that's true. I am who I choose to be. Pfft, no, baloney, Okay. Listen, when you're growing up, you are the product of your environment. And so 
Your family largely is, is your influence and shapes who you become for better or for worse. But when you get out from your family's house, it's your friendships that change you and that shape and mold you. No one, no one develops and grows up in a vacuum. We are the product of our environment. One pastor said, and you've probably heard this before, you are the average of your five closest friends. Now, I don't know what truth there is to that, but you just look at that list of your friends and you say, am I much different than them or have I been shaped by them? The chances are you have influenced them, they have influenced you and, and where they are is largely where you are, okay? So early in life, you're shaped by family. Later in life, you're shaped by your friends and like it or not, who we are is largely a product of who we are around. And so listen, if your friends are a bunch of morons, chances are you got a bunch of friends for morons, okay? You got, and you'll be influenced by that and you'll make stupid, foolish decisions because of who's around you. But if you've got wise, godly friends who are influencing you, chances are you will be a wise and godly person. It's not, it's not a perfect formula, but it, it's helpful, okay? Proverbs 27 talks about how friends uh, sharpen each other. I think that's the verse, right? Proverbs 27, 17. Let me, let me double check. Iron sharpens iron, and so one man sharpens another. Okay? You, there's, there's tension. There's conflict that happens. There's shaping. There's molding. But a sharpening occurs. And for men and women, the friends that we have will either sharpen you or dull you. So you got to be really careful in what kind of friends you choose what kind of friends you commit to because they're gonna be the ones who challenge you and who change you. Now, something happens when we, when we look at this, okay? That, that a good friend, a godly friend, chooses you, commits to you, challenges you, and changes you. That we start to think, you know what? I, I want that. I wa we want these kinds of friends, don't we? Even just one, just give me one good friend like that who will choose me and who will commit to me and who will challenge me to grow and to be better as a person and who will shape and mold my future. Give me one. We have a longing for deep friendships like that. But if we're honest with ourselves, we know we're not those kinds of friends for others, are we? Like would we measure ourselves against this kind of godly friend, we understand that many of us are unwilling to invest the kind of time and commitment and energy that's necessary to become this kind of friend for other people. As much as we long for it, as much as we want it, we don't do it. So we, we suffer under this desire for this and yet this crushing reality that we aren't this at the same time. So what do we do? What do we do? We trust Jesus, right? We look to Jesus. It's the answer to every sermon that I preach. Go to John chapter 15 with me real quick. This, we'll close this out. John chapter 15. <clears throat> John 15. Pick it up in uh, verse 12. John 15, starting in verse 12. This is my commandment. This is Jesus speaking. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and so your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Now, catch the context here. This is right before all of Jesus' friends are going to abandon him and forsake him and betray him. Like you skip a couple chapters ahead and, and everything starts to go south for Jesus. All of his friends abandon him, forsake him. Judas betrays him. But in this moment, before all that happens, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. 
and he loved his friends to the end. In fact, Jesus is telling us here, I am the ultimate friend who will lay down his life for his friends. Do you see that? Do you see that Jesus chose you? That he was so loyal to you that he left the glories of heaven to come after you? Do you see that Jesus committed to you by going to the cross to die in your place? That he didn't just inflict the wounds of a friend, he actually took the wounds of a friend for you so that you could be restored. That Jesus lost friendship with God so that we could receive it. That even Jesus' posture on the cross has his arms wide open, stretched out as far as they can go, made vulnerable for you. And the Bible tells us that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. I've said this before, the only thing that Jesus did not have on this side of the cross that he had on the other side of the cross is you. The only thing for the joy set before him, what was the joy set before Jesus? The only thing he didn't have on this side of the cross that he had on the other side of the cross was you. Jesus chose you, he committed to you. And if you surrender your life to the lordship of Jesus, he will continue to challenge you. He is full of grace and truth, loving you as you are, but loving you too much to let you stay that way. He will challenge you. And if you walk with Jesus, he will change you. He will change your heart. He will change your mind. He will change your identity. He will change your motives. And Jesus will empower you to be this kind of friend for others. There's no other way. You can try. You can try on your own to go, okay, I'm going to find some people. I'm going to choose them. I'm going to commit to them. I'm going to challenge them. I'm going to change. No, no, no. You'll fail them. Real big. But as you walk with Jesus and you abide in the friendship of God through Jesus, you will be empowered to be this kind of friend, the kind of friend the world needs. We got a lot of acquaintances, but not many friends. So as we wrap this up, I want to throw a few questions on the screen for you that I really do want you to spend some time considering, whether it's right now or, uh, or this afternoon, this evening. I think these will be helpful for you as, as you go forward here. First question is this, when do I most deeply feel the need for good friends? By the way, in the research that I looked at that I mentioned earlier, um, it said that the younger the person so demographically, millennials and below, the younger you get, the more digitally connected you are, but the lonelier you are. When do I most deeply feel the need for good friends? Where, where does my soul cry out? If I only had someone to talk to about this, if I only had one friend I could trust with this information, if I could only depend on one person for this, where do I most deeply feel that need? Secondly, what kind of friends do I have? And what kind of friend am I? Do I have friends that choose me, that commit to me? Am I the kind of friend who commits to other people, who, who helps shoulder that burden with them? Or am I the kind of friend that says, hey, call if you need anything? What kind of friends do I have? Do I have a bunch of idiot morons for friends? <laughs> do I have some wise counsel in my bullpen? Third, long one here. How does friendship with God that's granted to me through a relationship with Jesus Christ, free and empower me to be the kind of friend that other people need? How does friendship with God that's given to me, granted to me by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, his perfection in my place, his death for my sin, his resurrection to free me and, and reconcile me to God, how does that relationship free and empower me to be the kind of friend that the world needs? And then last, who in my life needs a good friend. Think about people that you're in relationship with, coworkers, neighbors, others. Who in my life needs a good friend right now? And might God be calling me to be that kind of friend for them? Okay, so I'm gonna leave these questions up on the screen for you. I'm gonna pray for you. In the